<clears throat> well, do my best. Yeah, I obviously have a bad cold here. My voice is going, but I'll we'll muddle through here. Um, so we're going to talk about acids and bases. I've given a little hints about them up to this point, but we're going to actually spend a little time discuss a little more in depth what an acid and what a base is. Well, first we need to be able to actually define acids and bases, and there are basically three primary theories or three primary sets of definitions and ways you can characterize a substance as an acid or base. Acid or base. So we're going to discuss just two of them, really, uh, in this class, but I want to go over them real briefly. So the first one is called, <coughs> pardon me, <coughs> the Arrhenius acid-base theory. Now, in the Arrhenius theory, an acid is anything that when you put it into water, it either ionizes or dissociates and makes some H+. So when it breaks apart, it makes H+. So that's an Arrhenius acid. You put it into water, it makes H+. A base, by its definition, is anything that you put into water and makes hydroxide. So for example, for the acid example, HCl. HCl, you would think at first, oh, that must be a molecular compound because hydrogen and chlorine are both two nonmetals. But because it is an acid, it has this H+, when you put it into water, it actually ionizes and makes H+, and Cl-. So, it makes H+, therefore it's an acid according to the Arrhenius definition. <clears throat> now, a base is anything you put into... Oh, I've got to mention one thing, though. Now, you will see acids written like this all the time, H+. But realize, when an H+, is in water, it doesn't really stay as H+. Hydrogen ions are crazy reactive. They are basically just a proton, if you think about it. Because a hydrogen, if you find it, if you find it through the periodic table, so it got one proton. It's got one proton and one electron. So if it's H plus, it's lost the electron. So all it is is just a proton. So really, all you have is a free proton. So that proton <clears throat> immediately grabs onto a water in the uh, solution and makes this stuff H three. O plus. So you'll see these written interchangeably. You might see an acid called H plus, or you might see an acid called H3O plus. And this has a special name. We call this hydronium. So kind of like ammonium was NH4 plus, hydronium is H3O plus. So again, you'll see them called H plus or H3O plus. Just be aware of that. You'll see both Okay. Oh, there's only a picture I want to show you real quick. Uh, about two years ago now, I went to Sweden and Denmark to like, do like a little study abroad thing for chemistry. And this is at the University of Stockholm. And their chemistry department is called the Arrhenius Laboratory, you can see, because again, named for this guy, his name is Svante Arrhenius. He was a famous Swedish chemist. Um, he won the Nobel Prize real early, like 1903, one of the first Nobel laureates. Um, and this is a little statue of him right outside there. So there you see Svante Arrhenius. Um, he also did a lot of other stuff, we'll see. Um, well, 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 not actually, we'll see, but if you look at him, he did, all kinds of, he did a lot of stuff actually way back in the early 1900s, like with greenhouse gases, which you, th which you think would be, be more of like a recent study, but he was doing that way back in the late 1800s, early 1900s with greenhouse gases and things like that. But So yeah, so that's Svante Arrhenius at Stockholm there. <coughs> um, so, again, acids make H+. Plus. So, when you have an acid, we're going to always, um, the formula will always start with an H, which will be a giveaway that's an acid. And, it, and it's always going to be in water, so we're always going to have a little AQ after it, aqueous, to show it's dissolved in water. Now, if it's not dissolved in water, if it's just, let's say, in its gaseous state or its liquid state, then we technically don't name it as an acid. You could just name it like a molecular compound hydrogen monochloride or hydrogen chloride. But if it's in an acid, oh, we're going to give it a special name, like hydrochloric acid. So you can tell, it's got an H+, plus, so it's going to have an H in the front, it's going to end with aqueous. Okay? <coughs> so, HCl, aqueous. Oh, that's an acid. H2SO4, aqueous. Oh, that's an acid. Starts with H, and it's aqueous. Starts with H, and it's aqueous. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> That's the acid part. <coughs> oh, I'm so sorry. Well, how do we name these things? So, you already know, hopefully by now, 
how to name ionic compounds, and how to name molecular compounds. There was only a very few rules for naming molecular compounds, and there's only three rules for naming acids, so they're pretty easy if you know how to do the ionics. If not, then you're going to be extra screwed at this point, because it's all based off the ionic naming. So there's only three rules. So basically, when it splits up and the H plus comes off, whatever it leaves behind, if that anion ends in ide, like let's say chloride, bromide, iodide, cyanide, it was an ide, then the acid, you just put hydro on the front and ic acid on the end. So easy example, HCl. So if HCl, if HCl ionizes in water, it's going to make H plus, it's going to leave behind Cl negative. Okay, well, how do you name chlorine by itself as an anion? Chloride. Chloride. I, oh, so I take the chlor off the chloride, chlor, so it's hydrochloric acid. So you just, if it ends in I, just hydro then ic. <clears throat> HBr, same kind of deal. HBr, you put it in the water, it makes H+, plus, which means it must also make Br-, minus. Br-, minus. that's bromine by itself, so we call it bromide. So drop the I, the brome, so hydrobromic acid. Okay? <clears throat> You're giving me a crazy look. Let me draw something here. This is the anion. This is the acid. If the anion ends in ide, then the acid is hydroic acid. If the anion ends in eight, like sulfate, carbonate, nitrate, all those eights you know, phosphate, then the acid is just ic acid. Change, drop the eight, put ic acid, but no hydro. <clears throat> and if it ends in ite, sulfite, nitrite, things like that, then it becomes us acid. That's it, it's only three rules. So as long as you know the names of those ions, like sulfate, nitrate, nitrite, sulfite, carbonate, whatever, all you gotta do is just figure out, oh, does it end in ite, eight, or ite, and change it to Hydro, ick, ick, or us. That's really it. Okay, so let me, let me go back to that other slide. How about this one? HI. Oh, if I lose an H+, plus, I must be behind an I-. minus. Iodine by itself is iodide. So if I drop the ide, I leave iode. So hydro, iode, ick, acid. See how I'm doing that? I'm just... Taking the chlor and putting it in here, or taking the brome and putting the brome in there, or taking the iode, right, and just putting it right in there. That's all I do is drop the iode and replace it with what I showed you, hydroic. <clears throat> okay, okay, how about the eights? Again, this could be any of the eights, you know. Chlorate, sulfate, phosphate, carbonate, we know lots of eights, nitrates. Okay, well this, if this went into water, oh, that makes it H+, plus, so it leaves ClO3 negative. And you know that ClO3 negative is called chlorate. So the acid changed the H to ic. So chlorate becomes chloric acid. See what I'm saying? <clears throat> How about this? H2. So if I lose two H pluses, that leaves behind SO4 2 minus. What's SO4 2 minus called? Sulfate. Eight. Oh, take the 8 and put on, change it to ic acid. The only minor difference is for both sulfur and for phosphorus, we don't just call it sulfic acid. We do put the little er back in to make it flow a little better, so we call it sulfuric acid. Same thing with, same thing with phosphate, or, well, phosphate, but, but, but with phosphorus in general. So then I'll just give you an example. Let's say we had... H3PO4 aqueous. PO4 negative, I mean PO4 negative is called phosphate, so 8 will go to ic. So I don't just call it phosphate becomes phosphic. I put the er back in there, so 
phosphorus becomes phosphoric. So, phos. I'll put this little ore back in there. Phoric acid. <coughs> Excuse me. So, that's only anytime you have a sulfur containing one or a phosphorus containing one, you put the little er or the ore back in there instead of just leaving it like you do with every other one. Okay, the last one is it. You know a lot of the ites. It is normally when you take the eight, and what happens? How's it go from eight to it? You lost an oxygen, right? Chlorate, ClO3, chlorite, ClO2. Sulfates, SO4, sulfites, SO3. If it's it, just change it to us. So ClO2 is chlorite, so the acid must be chlorus. NO2 is nitrite, so the acid must be nitrous. Just change it to us. Okay? <clears throat> That's it. There's only three rules. <clears throat> so like I said, as long as you know those anion names, which hopefully you do by now, after a month and a half, uh, then you're good to go. <clears throat> so let me just, let's just try a couple here. Practice. If you have a couple here to practice with. Uh, here we go. H2S. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, I'll do a couple of these with you. So, help me out here. If I, so I have H2, so that means I have two H pluses coming off there, right? So what else is being left behind? Sulfur, and what's the charge going to be? Can you tell me? If I take off two H positives, if I take off two H positives, i got to leave behind two negatives. Okay, what's this called? You should all know the name for this. Hydrosulfuric? Just, now what's, what's that called? Sulfur by itself. Sulfur by itself, that's called? Sulfide, right? Aha, uh -huh, ide. If it's ide, what do I do? Drop the ide, put hydro on the front and ic acid on the end. So the acid must be hydrosulf, but again, I don't just call it sulfic, I do put the er back in for sulfur, so hydrosulfuric acid. So hydro on the front and ic acid on the end. That's what I it tells you to do. Okay, how about the next one, HI? Okay, well, if that breaks apart, it's going to make an H plus, and what else is it going to make? I negative. How do I name I negative? Iodide. Oh, look, again, I see I'd. What does I'd tell me to do? Oh, put hydro on the front and ic acid on the end. So how would you name this one? Yeah, it's a weird name, but hydro iodic ic acid. So the iode stays the same, right? You just change i to hydroic. Okay. I'll do one more with you. HNO2. So if I lost an H+, plus, what else would I leave behind? NO2 negative. Okay, how do we name NO2 negative? Nitrate. Nitrite. Because nitrate is NO3 negative. So what does what do you do with ite? Do you change the ite to what? Us. So it becomes nitrous acid. No hydro. People always want to put hydro on these for some reason. Mm -hmm. Only do hydro if it's ide. The big be like, "Why well, is not hydro? There's a hydrogen there. Does not matter. <laughs> Does it just ide to us?" Okay, your turn. Try the next two. Figure out what's the ion by itself called. And then once you know the suffix, then you can figure out how to what to change it into. There's only three options.
<coughs> okay, why don't you compare D with your neighbor, HCN. What do you think HCN would be called? What do you think? Okay, what'd you get for D? Hydrocyanic. Hydrocyanic, right. All right, the right because this is this leaves behind CN negative, which is called cyanide. Oh, I'd change it to hydro X. I'm gonna put hydro on the front. Keep the cyan. Ic acid. Hydrocyanic acid, right? Okay, next one, if you haven't done it yet. H2SO3. What do you call SO3? And then once you know that, you can figure out the acid name. Okay, what do you think for E? Did you compare yet? Okay, what's SO3 called by itself normally? Yeah, so SO3, two, two H's, so it must be two negative. That's called sulfite, exactly. And I, you turn to us, so sulfurous, and you do put the er back because it's sulfur, so sulfurous acid. It's really not that bad. There's only three little rules to learn. So. Okay, let's try a couple the, the other way here. <coughs> so, <coughs> chlorous acid. So let's think about this. Us acid tells me the anion must have been called what? Chlorite. Right? So, so what's the formula for chlorite? Let's just do this step by step here. CO2 negative. CO2 negative. So if I want to make it into an acid, it's one negative, so I got to have how many hydrogens? One. So HClO2, you got to have that aqueous on there. Okay, time out. Does that make sense? So us tells me it came from ite. So chlorus must have come from chlorite. What's chlorite? Oh, well, you know chlorate, ClO3 negative, so chlorite must be a ClO2 negative. That's one negative, so I only need one H plus to balance it out. So HClO2 aqueous. Okay. Let's try the next one. I see ic acid. What does ic acid tell me? Eight. Came from eight. So phosphoric must have come from phosphate. What is phosphate's formula in charge? PO4 three. PO4 three negative. Oh, three negative, which means it needs three hydrogens. So what's the formula going to be? H3PO4. H3PO4. Don't forget the aqueous. Getting it? Okay. Try the next one. Hydrobromic acid. So you have the all the clues you need there to figure out what the ion must be. So hydrobromic.
Okay, compare with the neighbor there, hydrobromic. <coughs> Okay, what does hydrobromic tell me the acid must end, I mean the anion must end with? What? I'm sorry? What did you say? What does hydrobromic tell me the acid must end with? I mean not the acid, the anion must end with. Hydroic acid tells me it must end with ide, so it must have been bromide. Ide. No, non-metal by itself. So just bromine by itself. So you can find bromine on your periodic table. It's one away from the noble gases, so it must be one negative. So how many hydrogen pluses do I need to balance it out? Just one. So H, B, R, aqueous. Yes? That's when bromine is like, just like not combined with anything, just totally free. But this is it's with hydrogen. It's in a compound now. So in a compound, it can be whatever it wants. I mean, like oxygen. Oxygen is O2, and it's just floating around by itself. In a compound, it can be SO4 or CO3. It can be all kinds of different things. It's just in a compound now. So yeah, in a compound, it can be, yeah, yeah, whatever. No, that's fine. No, yeah, that, 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 that's, a, that's a good question. Okay. What does ic acid tell me? Carbonic acid. Eight. Must have come from 8. So it must have come from carbonate. Carbon eight. Carbon eight. All right. What's carbonate's formula in charge? CO3, CO3 2 minus. CO3 2 minus. So what would the acid formula be? H2CO3 aqueous. Awesome. H2CO3 aqueous aqueous. <clears throat> Aquamanius. Okay, did you try the last one yet? Okay. Nit whoops. Nitric. Uh, same thing. Ic acid tells me it must have come from what? Nitrate. Eight. So nitrate. What's nitrate's formula? NO3 negative. NO3 negative. So it must be H N O three aqueous. Okay, like I said it's it's really easy if you know how to name the anions. If not, you get a little uphill battle there, but okay. So good job. <clears throat> so that's the acids. An Arrhenius acid, anything you put into water, it produces H plus. Arrhenius base, you put it into water, it produces hydroxide. So pretty much any of those hydroxides that we learned are soluble, those are going to be bases. So sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, lithium hydroxide. So, so for example, the classic one is always NaOH. You put it into water, you know from solubility rules, anything with sodium is soluble. So it's going to break up and make sodium ions and hydroxide ions. So therefore, it must be a base. So it makes hydroxides, so it's a base. So that's the Arrhenius, the Arrhenius way. Acids are H+, plus, hydroxides are H negative. I mean, I mean, bases are hydroxides. Now, that is the most limiting way. It is the most narrow definition. We'll see in a little bit. There's a broader definition that for acid bases, there's even a broader one that'll encompass everything that could possibly be an acid or base. But this one's the most limited because it only considers acids as H plus producers and bases as hydroxide producers. But I'll show you another one later on. Okay, got that? Acids, Arrhenius acids, they make H plus, Arrhenius bases, they make hydroxide. Okay. Uh, why is this here again? I have no idea. Okay, so now, now like I said there's another theory that's a little broader, and it encompasses uh, more unusual acids and bases. It's called the Bronsted-Lowry theory. 
Now, Bronstadt Lowry, the acid part's pretty similar. Bronstadt Lowry asked this because there to be anything that donates a proton. Again, an H plus is the same as a proton because a hydrogen is a, pos a proton and an electron. If it's plus, it lost the electron, so it's just a proton. So it's the same thing. So a Bronstadt Lowry acid is anything that donates a proton. A Bronstadt Lowry base. Now, th now it's different because Arrhenius, a base was produces hydroxide. Here, a base is accepts the H plus. It accepts the proton. In other words. So, a little different. <clears throat> Sorry. So, uh, acid makes H+, plus, base accepts H+. Plus. So, let me show you an example. HCl, I showed you before, that is an Arrhenius acid because it does make H+. Plus. But everything that's an Arrhenius acid also qualifies under bronsted lauer because it's a bigger category. It includes all the Arrhenius ones plus some other ones. So how does it act, act like a bronsted lauer Well, I told you when you put it into water, what it basically does is it takes that H+, gives it to the water, and makes hydronium. So, if you, so you could write a reaction like this. So you see here on this one, the HCl took the H+, and gave it to the water and it made hydronium. So, the HCl acted like a bronsted lowry acid. Now, the water took the H plus from the HCl. So since it took the H plus, it acted like a proton acceptor, or a bronsted lowry base. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, give me the, the odd look. That makes sense? You see what happened between the left and the right side, the reactant side? To the left and the right, what happened? HCl gave its H plus to H2O. And the H2O became H3O plus. And the HCl lost the H and just left Cl minus. See that? So do you see why one is donating and one is accepting? Does that make sense? No? Uh, so if it was like... So, you see, water went from H2O to H3O+. Plus. Therefore, it must have... What's the difference between those two? Oh, it gained an H+. Plus. If you gain an H+, plus, you're a base. HCl and Cl-, minus. what's the difference? Oh, it lost an H+. Plus. If you lose H+, plus, you're an acid. What's it was? <laughs> what? What'd you say? If it was H2S plus H2O, how would it... How would it Sure. It would do it in steps. It doesn't do it all at once. It would do the same thing. So first it would give one of its H pluses and make H3O plus and it would leave HS negative. Okay. And then HS negative could actually do it again. Wait, but uh, and uh, make H3O plus. Even though S has a and negative S2 charge? Yeah. Oh, okay. It doesn't matter. Well, it's negative, too, because it, it has no hydrogen H pluses. This is two H pluses okay. with an S2 minus. So I, so I took away one first, which left behind HS negative. Then I took away the next one, which left behind the S2 negative. So that's the acid-base way. Now, the... <coughs> um, now, for bases, let me show you an example of how a bronsted lowry base works. It's a little different because, again, under Arrhenius, bases were things that they had hydroxide already in them. You put them into water, and they broke apart and made hydroxide. But there are other things like this one, ammonia. NH3, there's no hydroxide in NH3 inherently, but it does indirectly still make hydroxide. What's it do? It reacts with water. So... Now, since NH3 acts like a base, which means it's going to accept an H+. Plus. So if it takes an H+, plus from this water, it's going to become 
it was in H3, now it's in H4 plus. And then it leaves behind hydroxide. So in this case, the water gave an H plus to ammonia, so the water was the acid. The ammonia took the H plus to become ammonium, so it was the base. Whichever one goes up by an H plus was the acid. Whichever one goes down by an H plus was the base. No, no, I'm sorry, the other way around. Whichever one goes up by an H plus must have accepted it. So it was the base. So if you compare the left and the right side, which one went up by an H plus? NH3 to NH4 plus. So, oh, it between the left and the right side, it gained an H plus. That makes it a base. H2O to OH minus. Between the left and the right side, it lost an H plus. That makes it the acid. Yeah, read. Uh, can, you, can you clarify one more time why it's not NH2 plus H3O? I don't know, for the products. Why it's not like, why? Why did a hydrogen from the acid go, go to the base instead of the base to the acid? Is that just the um, it's a little beyond the scope of this class. You won't have to worry about why, but, but I can give you the nutshell version is because I don't want to confuse everybody else, but basically ammonia looks like this. So we're never going to have to solve for the... No, we're going to have to know which is which. You're going to be, be able to look at it and say, tell me which one was the acid in the base. Okay, okay. But basically this has a lone pair, which is two big negatives. It wants to get positives. So it likes to take an H positive oh. and make ammonia. The other way is not true. It doesn't want to give up and and um, make it even more negative. So, so that's the nutshell answer. But you come back in 110 and we'll explain all that lovely stuff. So but the interesting thing is what happened here was when the acid gave up its H+, plus, it then became something that needed an H+. Plus. So it went from being an acid on one side to a base on the other side. And the thing that was the base needed the H+. Plus. It took the H+, plus, so now it becomes something that has an H+. Plus. It became an acid. So whatever was the acid becomes a base. Whatever was the base becomes an acid. And we call these conjugate pairs. So you often hear it will say, oh, the acid became the conjugate base. The base became the conjugate acid. That happened for the last equation, correct? What we just answered. Yeah, so. right, yeah, exactly. Yeah so, yeah, so every time this happens, anytime an acid and a base react like this, the acid, the acid now lost an H+, plus and it wants one, so now it's, now it's a base. The base now gained an H+, plus, so now it has one to give. It's an acid. So it just goes back and forth. We call those acid-base pairs. And again, the easiest way to come apart, I've already mentioned this, they're only going to differ by an H+. Plus. So, so between the left and the right side, you can see one of them gained an H+, plus, and one of them lost an H+. Plus. The one that gained the H plus was acting like the base. The one that lost the H plus was acting like the acid. So you can't tell which one's an acid to start with? You can only tell after the reaction got there? Yes. Okay. Basically, yes. That was my confusion. Unless it's like HF, because HF we know is an acid, because the formula starts with an H. I mean, things like that. But if it's like NH3, that one you can't really tell. Okay, so I want to show you. Here's another example. The, the, the one we just did. We just did NH3 plus H2O goes to NH4 plus plus OH minus. So, compare the left side and the right side. If you compare the two sides, you can see the between the left and the right side, NH3 went to NH4 plus. So the NH3 apparently gained an H plus, right? If it gains an H+, plus, that makes it a acid or base. If it gains an H+, plus. acids give H+. Plus. If it takes an H+, plus, so NH3 went to NH4+. Plus. <clears throat> okay, what's the difference in those two? 
an H+, plus, right? The only difference in those two is an H+. Plus. Between an NH3 and NH4+, plus, they differ by an H+. Plus. So apparently what happened? Apparently, this gained an H+. Plus. Right? That makes sense? Between here, between the... Oh, if it gains an H+, plus, that makes it a base. What happened between here and here? It lost an H+. Plus. It went from H2O to OH negative. Right? So, between, so this one lost an H+. Plus. If you lose an H+, plus, that makes you an acid. See, see, okay, so the thing that was the base now became an acid because it has an H plus to give. The thing that was a base now became, I mean, it was an acid, now became a base because it now wants an H plus. So they just kind of go back and forth. So let's look here. Uh, maybe. <coughs> okay, so let's look at a couple here. So pull out your handout, hopefully you have it there. <coughs> so, we're just going to compare the left side and the right side and see. It's going to be, they're going to vary by an H+. Plus. One thing will have gained an H+, plus, one thing will have lost an H+. Plus. So, HBr, is HBr, is its pair, is it, so which one does it differ by an H+, plus from? H3O+, plus or Br-? minus? Okay, HBr and Br- minus only differ by an H+, plus, right? So, between HBr and Br-, minus, did it lose an H+, plus or did it gain an H+. Plus? It lost. So, if it lost an H+, plus, was it an acid or a base? Yes. Awesome. That means this became the conjugate base. I'll just put Cb. <coughs> so, what else only varies by an H plus? H two O. H2O. Right, going to H three O plus. Those only vary by an H plus. So, did H two O gain an H plus or lose an H plus? It gained an H plus. It took an H plus. If it takes an H plus, is it an acid or a base? If it, if it takes an H plus, it's a base. Right. So, H two O was the base which means hydronium is the conjugate acid. <laughs> Sorry. So are we not focusing anymore on the uh, uh, the first base law you showed us? Not right now. Okay. No. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Let's look at these two. So between the left and the right side, find the two pairs. They'll always just differ by an H+. Plus. So I'll let you look at it and think about it for a second. So, so which two are paired up? And then figure out, did it go up by an H plus or did it go down by an H plus? So which, which two are connected? CH3, NH2, and CH3, NH3 plus, or CH3, NH2, and OH negative? Which two, are com which two are connected? And then what's water connected with? Which of those two? Okay, so CH3 and NH2, CH3 and NH2, that must be connected to CH3 and NH3+, plus, right, of course, because those only differ by an H+. Plus. So what happened between the left and the right side? It gained an H+. Plus. So if it gained an H+, plus, what is it? Base. It is a base. Right? Everybody see that? which means this must be the conjugate acid. Well, the water and the hydroxide also only differ by an H+. Plus. So 
what happens between the left and the right side? It lost an H+. plus. So if it loses an H+, plus, it is a acid, right? Which means this must be the conjugate base. Making sense? Slowly, but surely. Okay, good. Okay, let's try. And let's just try to predict what would the conjugate base if be if each of these acted like an acid. So HCO three negative. If it acts like an acid, what's it do? It loses an H plus. So if it loses an H plus, gives it to somebody else, what would it leave behind? CO3 what? Right. So that would be the conjugate base of bicarbonate. It has to lose an H plus. Or I could write it another way if that confused you. I could just write it. I could write it had to lose an H plus, right? If it loses an H plus, what's it gonna leave behind? CO3 2 negative. How about this one? What if HClO2 behaved like an acid? Oh, if it behaves like an acid, that means it lost an H+. Plus. So what would it leave behind if it lost an H+. Plus? So we're going to lose the H, a ClO2. If we lost a plus, we must leave behind a negative. So that would be conjugate base. Okay, think about that for a second. He's going to take away an H+, plus, right? So if I take away the H, that leaves ClO2. If I take away a plus, I must left behind a minus. So ClO2 minus. Okay, how about the opposite? What if, what if these were bases? What would the conjugate acids be? Okay, well, if phosphate acts like a base, what's it do? What do bases do? So I'm going to add an H plus to it. They're proton acceptors. So if I add an H plus to that, what would the result be? H H plus. Just one H plus, yes. HPO4, two minus. two minus. Three negative and a positive becomes... Again, we're not going all the way back to neutral. We're not making a compound. We're just... Taking one proton, just gaining or losing, the only difference by a proton. Okay, try the next one. Okay, so if it acts like a base, that means it's going to snag an H+. Plus. So what would it make? H2SO4. Mm -hmm. The positive and negative would balance out and make it neutral, right? Okay, good. Okay, well, we mentioned this before. <coughs> Excuse me. Strong electrolytes and weak electrolytes. Acids and bases fall in these same categories, where strong means all of it breaks up 100%. None of it stays together. Weak means a little bit of it breaks up, but most of it stays together. So a strong acid is an acid that ionizes 100%. All of it breaks up. So HCl is a strong acid. When you put it into water, none of it stays as HCl. All of it goes to chloride and hydronium. All of it. Okay. So completely 100% ionizes. That next part you don't need, need to really need to write down because I told you. So the nice thing is there's only a few 
<coughs> acids that are strong. So if you know which acids are strong, then every other acid in the world has to be weak by comparison. There's only six that are strong. So the other 50,000 possible acids in the world that aren't one of those six must be weak, which means you put them in the water. A little bit breaks up, but most of it stays together, unlike the strong ones. So here are the six strong ones. So put these in your brain. So make a note, memorize these, highlight it, something. These are the six strong. And again, the reason it's nice to know these because every other acid you encounter, hydrofluoric, acetic, citric acid, ascorbic acid, whatever else you can think of, lactic acid, any other acid you think of in the world must be a weak acid if it's not one of these six. So H, HI, HBR, HClO4, HCl, H2SO4, and HNO3. Those are the six strong acids. Make a note, put a little asterisk there, memorize those six. So any other acid you've ever heard of? Citric acid, I don't know, whatever you've heard of. They must be weak, because it's not one of those six. Now you notice five of these are what we call monoprotic because they only have one proton. See, they only have one H, 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 H. So we call those monoprotic acids. All right, so like H, 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 H. But notice one of them, sulfuric acid, has two protons. It's H2SO4. So what do you think we call it? Diprotic. Yes, you are so smart. If it was one was mono, two was di. So H2SO4 is called a diprotic acid. And there are even acids that have a lot more. Like, for example, we saw phosphoric acid was H3PO4. So that one you might call triprotic. Okay. So, these acids, if you put them in the water, 100% of them break up into H and I, or H and BR, or H and chlorate, okay? I'm sorry, H and perchlorate, okay? None of it stays together. That's the strong ones. Now, the weak ones are, are just like weak electrolytes. Only a little bit of it breaks up, which is why we have our friend, the double arrow, the little delivery arrow. So, some of it breaks up, but some of it recombines back. Normally, it's much less than 100%. I mean, like, I mean, like 5% or less. Or it could be a millionth of a percent. I mean, it's really like way less than 100%. So HF, you put it into water. Unlike HCl, which only goes to hydronium and chloride, HF goes to hydronium and chloride, but then also recombines back to HF. So it's not 100% ionizing. So only a small fraction. So you see the little picture there on the bottom. You put it into water. And yes, a little bit of it ionized here. But the vast majority of it stays together. It stays intact. It does not ionize because it's a weak acid. Okay, so well, let's look at, um, oh, so one interesting thing is, I told you every acid becomes a base at the end, right, because of what's called the conjugate base. So it's interesting because the stronger the acid, the weaker its conjugate base, but the weaker the acid, the stronger the conjugate base. So if you think about it, if it's a strong acid, that means it really wanted to get rid of its H+. So whatever base it makes is a crappy base because it doesn't want to take that H plus back. And vice versa. If it was a weak acid, um, means it didn't really want to give up, means it didn't really want to give, 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 get, get, give up its H plus in the first place. Well, then once it becomes that base, it's happy to take it back. So strong acids become crappy bases, and weak acids become better bases. 
So it's kind of always the inverse there. All right. So, like I said, most of the assets you can think of are going to be weak. There's only six that are strong in the whole world. And they're going to have stronger conjugate bases. And because they're weak acids, means stronger conjugate bases. Okay, let's <coughs> so let's look here. Let's look at this one. So H2CO3 is a dipro... Oh, man, our class is canceled. Let's go home. Oh, no. No, that wasn't us. <laughs> so, uh, is a diprotic acid. Why is it diprotic? Two H's. Two protons, two H's. So, it's not one of our six strong acids, right? Correct, Amundo, right? Yeah. So, it must be weak. So, it's going to release one H plus to make a hydronium and bicarbonate. Well, bicarbonate still has another H plus to give, so it can do it a second time, and then bicarbonate can give an H plus and become hydronium and carbonate. So we have two steps. So we have this step where it gives up, the first one is up here. I'll highlight this one. And then it can do it again because it still has an H plus left, right? Right? It still has an H plus left to give after it gives up one because I had two to start with. Right? So it gives up one, and then it says two times, fool, and it does it again. And it gives up a second time. So it's an acid, but it can do it twice because it's diprotic. Again, if it was triprotic, it could do it three times. If it was hexaprotic, it could do it six times, whatever. So, okay. but. I'm sorry. Uh, so the second one is HCO3 negative? It gives away another... H plus. H plus to CO3. Yes, between here and here, whoops, it lost an H plus. So if HCO3 negative loses another positive, it becomes CO3 two negative. Between here and here, it lost its first H plus. Between there and there, it lost the second H plus. Can you predict why HCO3 negative becomes CO3 two negative? Because if you take away an H plus, then that leaves a CO3. Take away another positive from the negative, that makes it twice as negative, two negative. Okay, H2SO4 can do the same thing. So let's just write the second one together. So the first proton being donated would look like this. It gives away an H plus. To the water makes hydronium and leaves behind HSO4 negative. <coughs> so what would the second one look like? So if that one goes in water, what would it make? <coughs> if it's going to act like an acid, we're saying. What do you think? H3O plus, if I take away the H from the HSO4, that leaves SO4, and it was minus, but now it's also positive, so exactly now it's 2 minus. So that, was, so, so that would be the second ionization. <clears throat> now the difference between this one and the last one I showed you, The last one was carbonic acid, which we said was a weak acid, right? So, so that first one was a two-way street, right? So carbonic acid does break up into bicarbonate, but bicarbonate goes back to carbonic acid, right? This one's a strong acid. Sulfuric acid only breaks up into hydronium and HSO4 negative. You can't recombine that one. It will not go back because it's a strong acid. It's 100%. It, it can only ionize it. That's the importance of the six strong acids. It's only a one-way street. Okay, and we already wrote this one because we did a good job. Okay. Okay, so strong bases are very, very basically the same kind of thing. A strong acid 100% breaks apart. A strong base 100% breaks apart. So, for example, 
NaOH is a strong base. When you put NaOH into water, 100% of it breaks apart into sodiums and hydroxides. None of it stays together as sodium hydroxide. Okay, 100% of it ionizes. That's what makes it a strong base. Okay, so which are the strong bases? There's only about six of these, too. They are the hydroxides that are formed from the group one and the group two metals. So, so the group one metals are like, remember, lithium, sodium, potassium. So any of those hydroxides are going to be strong. And then the, the group two hydroxides, like strontium, calcium, barium, those are the strong bases. Pretty much any other hydroxide you can think of, again, but has to be a weak one then. So it must not 100% dissociate. It won't be a soluble. Man, I wish I had a Kleenex. If I have a Kleenex, I could borrow a paper towel, anything. Okay, okay, I'll live. Or your shirt sleeve, I can borrow your shirt sleeve. Oh. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll we'll do that in a second. <laughs> so, so 100%, right? Boom, one way arrow. All it does is dissociate. Okay, I got some. Okay. Far away. There's a bathroom too. Down the hallway, I can run right to you. Thank you. Oh, so cute. Got a little bear on there. Oh, but Korean writing on there too. Speaking of Korean, like we put nice the writing. Of course, I can't blow my nose because I can't get the bag open. Uh, okay, anyway. Oh, there it is. Let's see. Now, a weak base is just the opposite. You put it into water, right? It's like a weak acid. It doesn't 100% break up, right? So only a little bit of it acts like a base. So in other words, only a little bit of it accepts an H+. And the classic one is ammonia, which I already showed you, NH3. You put NH3 into water, a little bit of it takes an H plus to make ammonium, but most of it doesn't care. So you put NH3, we saw earlier, into water, two-way street. Some of it does take an H3, H plus and become NH4 plus and hydroxide, but again, most of it doesn't. Most of it stays by itself and doesn't do that. See that? So if it was strong, all of it would do that, right? But it's weak, so only a little bit. Again, much less than 5% typically. <clears throat> okay. All righty. So... Now, we know when we have an equilibrium, what's that mean? That means the rate in the forward direction is the same as the rate in the reverse direction, right? That's why it's called equilibrium. So, that means at whatever rate the HA is actually breaking up is the same rate at which these are recombining back, right? This is equilibrium. So, the rate of the dissociation is the same as the rate as the association. So I could write an equilibrium expression, just like we learned last chapter. A K is going to be concentration of products over reactants. But now we don't call it KEQ or KC. Now we call it KA, because it's an acid, A for acid. So same deal, products over reactants. And you know, what kind of substances do you not include in Ks? Solids and liquids. So you notice we did not include... 
the liquid water on the bottom here, right? Right? Because it's a liquid. <coughs> so let's think about this then. Let's say I had a number for Ka, some kind of a value. We know if the K is bigger, what does that mean? Roy has no idea. No, there's more product? Yes, if it's bigger, that means this number must be bigger. So it must be more products. If K is smaller, it means you're dividing by a bigger number. There must be more of the reactants. So in our case, if I had a really big K, is it a better acid or is it a worse acid? If K is big, is it acting more like an acid and actually making products? Or is it mostly staying together? If K is large. Well, think about mathematically. If K is, K is bigger, big, is there more of these or more of these if K is big? Products. More of these, more products. So it must be a good acid, right? Because it's because it is dissociating a lot. If K is small, that means it's a crappy acid and most of it's staying together as HA. So I think I have an example here for you. Um, okay, here's an example. Formic acid. <clears throat> this is what's found in bee stings, ant bites. If you happen to know the Latin name for an ant, it's like something formoate or something like that. I forget what it is. Which is why the acid is called formic, because the acid is like something formoate or whatever it is. Yes? Larger Ka, larger Ka indicates the acid must have been stronger. Most of it must, more of it then must be dissociating into products. If it was a small Ka, that means, oh, mostly still reacting, so it's not dissociating. So, you have this formic acid, so I can write the Ka for that. I would put products over reactants. Hydronium, CHO2 negative, I could put right in there for that. HCHO2, I could put it in for here. That has a value of 1.8 times 10 to the negative fourth. So again, that number tells me something about the relative strength of that acid compared to other ones. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, let me show you a big chart here. Maybe this will make it more clear. See? So, yeah, write them all down. No, I'm kidding. It's in your book, 10.4. So notice they go from up here at the top, 10 to the negative third, down to 10 to the negative 13th. Which of these is the strongest of those acids? The ones at the top. The ones that are bigger numbers, right? So this is so more of these are going to products versus these. These are mostly staying as the reactants, right? They're not dissociating. Okay, brains are thinking. Does that make sense? A big K means the number on top, the products must be big. So that means, yes, it's associating and making me products. So a big number means it's a stronger acid. As it goes down, that means less of it's breaking up, more of it's staying together and not doing its acid thing. So these down here are getting crappier and crappier as acids, right? They're not very good acids as we go down. <coughs> so, let's just try and write the Ka for a couple of these. <coughs> so, HClO aqueous, that's not one of our six strong acids, so it is a weak acid. So, let me think. Let me try something besides a highlighter. If I put that into water, let's think about what would it do? So, if I put it into water, what would the two products be? What's one of the products? One of the products is easy. What? H3O. H3O plus. plus. Good. That's one of the products. Plus CLO. Yes, and if it, so once it loses its H plus, it leaves behind the CLO. If it lost the plus, it must be negative. So, 
how would I write the Ka for that? Let's see here. So what would I put in my Ka expression? Product for H3O. Concentration of H3O plus. What else? Times ClO. Concentration of ClO negative over what? Concentration HClO. Of course, don't include water because water is a liquid. What do you think? Yes. <clears throat> Why is it positive? Is it, oh, well, because when this acts like an acid, what does it give up? Hydrogen. It gives up an H positive. So it gave an H positive to that. Yes. Which is why this is now ClO negative because it lost a positive. Right. Okay. Okay, try the next one. Just for fun, name this acid. Nitrite's the anion. No, it's the acid. Nitrous. I to us. Nitrous acid. Okay, so write the Ka for nitrous acid. <coughs> Excuse me. Talk it over with your neighbor. What's your Ka expression look like? What over what? <coughs> Okay, do you and your neighbor agree? So your reaction looks something like, okay, put this into water. Equilibrium arrows. That means I make H3O plus, which we call hydronium, and NO2 negative, nitrite. Good. So yes, Ka is products over reactants. So concentration of hydronium times concentration of nitrite over concentration of nitrous acid. Great. Great. 12 minutes. So, uh, you noticed water, some of the time, acted like a base. Some of the time, water acted like an acid. It makes water unique. Not unique. There are a few other ones that do this, but relatively unique. So, we call water amphoteric. That's your new vocabulary word for the day. Amphoteric. That's a substance that can swing both ways. It can act like an acid. It can act like a base. It does whatever it wants. Well, not, not whatever it wants, but it does, I guess, whatever it needs to. It kind of adapts to the situation. Amphoteric. So water sometimes, it, so here it took an H plus and became hydronium. Here it gave an H plus and became hydroxide. So it did both. So it's called amphoteric. Now, the interesting thing is, because water can do both, it actually does both all the time. This 
So even in your bottles of water that I see around here right now, water is, some of the water is acting like an acid, some of the water is acting like a base. So you actually have little bits of acid right now you're ingesting, and little bits of base right now. <laughs> so you have both. <clears throat> so, one water could give a proton, and the other one could take one. So you wind up with both acid and base in the end. So again, so, so again that happens, like I said, you know, water all the time. It's happening right now in all the water. But it only happens to a very little bit. So we call this, by the way, the self-ionization, because it's just all by itself. It's already ionizing, becoming both an acid and a base. That's called the self-ionization. But again, it's a little double-headed arrow, so, so it's not doing it 100%, right? All of, the, all of the water in that bottle is not turning to acid and base, else you'd be choking and gasping, your throat would dissolve, and you'd fall on the ground and die. But uh, so only a little bit of it is turning into acid and base, just a little tiny bit of it. So I'll wait for you to finish writing down, that down. This is called self-ionization. Okay, <clears throat> so in pure water at a round room temperature, which is typically around 25 degrees Celsius, how much of it is actually turned to acid and base? Only about 1 times 10 to the negative 7th molar. Not a whole lot. 0. 0.00000001 moles in a liter. So not a whole lot. Well, the interesting thing that this allows us to do is Let's say I want to write a K for water now. So if I went back to that reaction and I wrote a K for this, what would it look like? It'd be concentration of H3O plus times concentration of hydroxide, what? Over nothing, right? Because those are both liquids, right? Right? Yeah. So. If I write a K, you're exactly right. It's like this. And we call that the KW, W for water. So if I put in this value for hydronium and this value for hydroxide, the KW for water is 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. Remember, make a big note of this because this is important to keep in your back of your brain. I will give it to you on a test. I mean, but just to keep in mind. That's an important concept right there. So, <clears throat> the interesting thing about this that this helps us to do is that means any time you have a solution in water, not just pure water, but any time you have a solution in water, the amount of acid in that solution times the amount of base always equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14th. So, that means if the acid goes up in your solution, it's going to stay constant, what's the base have to do? The base must go the opposite way, right? If both goes up, then this number goes up and changes, right? So, so any acid in water, any base in water, the amount of the acid in there times the base always equals this, which means if the acid goes up, in order for this number here to, here to stay constant, the base must go down, and vice versa. If the acid, base goes up, the acid must go down, etc. So this is an important relationship because, again, obviously most solutions happen in water, right? In your body and things in the lab, everything's going on in water. So even in your body, right, the amount of acid times the base equals 1 times 10 to the 14. Again, it's slightly different if you're not at this temperature, but not much. <clears throat> so if I take, take pure water and I just dump in some HCl, I dump in some acid, well, now obviously the amount of acid hydronium has gone up and it's greater than 10 to the negative 7th seven, now at that point. Well, again, if the acid has gone up, that means the base must have gone down in order for them to always multiply out and give me 10 to the negative 14. Okay? <coughs> right? So the effect is going to be less than. Okay. And vice versa. I think we got that. You guys should be getting that. So let's try one of these, and then we'll, maybe we'll wrap it up here in a couple minutes. So I am ready to go die, but I still have class from 2 till 7 after this. So. <sighs> so, the KW 
tells me that hydronium times hydroxide equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. So if the hydro what's the hydronium concentration? If the hydroxide is 5.0 times 10 to the negative 9th. Well, we just substitute, right? So hydronium must be 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th divided by the hydroxide, right? So 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th divided by 5.0 times 10 to the negative 9th. So punch that in your calculator or something like that and what you get. What'd you get? Two point. Two point. Two point what? Two point zero. Two point zero times ten to the negative seven. Negative seven. No, I can't be right. What is it? Negative. Two point zero times ten to the negative six. That sounds better. Sounds right. So that's that would be the concentration molarity of the hydronium. <clears throat> okay, let's do this one and we'll wrap it up. Your turn. You try one. Here's the hydronium and some lemon juice. What's the hydroxide? Okay, let me work it out real quick. We know that hydronium concentration times hydroxide concentration equals 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th. So hydroxide concentration would be 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th divided by the hydronium concentration, right? 
So 1.0 times 10 to the negative 14th over hydronium was 2.0 times 10 to the negative third. So 5.0 times something, what is it? Negative twelfth? More. Huh? Negative four. Five point five negative four more. Awesome. Yay us. We made it through somehow. <clears throat> okay, well, I will see you Monday, and we'll have a quiz on chapter nine on Monday. There's a homework's due Monday. Those are pretty short chapters, so it should be plus but do we need to scan Sean for Monday? I don't know. I'm with a quiz yet. Always bring one. Okay. Back up. <laughs> Just in case I don't know yet. All right. See you then.